Thank you, Gary. I want first to thank Lawrence and Margaret for being here at this uh, conference we planned for some time. Uh, this was conceived three years ago in a conversation in a in a wonderful establishment, I guess a tea house, uh, wasn't it? Uh, but they had other things. <laughs> in uh, London between Lawrence Hemming and Gary Anderson and myself. And uh, it's wonderful to see this come to fruition with so much support from the community and so much interest in this topic. Today it falls to me to speak of temple traditions beyond the familiar Judeo-Christian conventions. My remarks will be confined to a consideration of rites and patterns of temple worship found only in the ancient Mediterranean region including Egypt and Israel. While the theme of the conference is Mormonism and the Temple, examining ancient religious traditions, this paper will address entirely the ancient traditions and not examine questions of Mormon temple ceremony. However, many present who do have a knowledge of Mormon temples will doubtless observe similarities between temple rituals of the ancient world and those with which they possess familiarity through their own worship in temples. In Italy, Greece, Anatolia, and especially in Egypt, temple ceremonial and ritual seem to preserve elements of temple rites that were claimed to be stretched back in time to the ancient first fathers, to Enoch, whom pseudepigraphic tradition portrays as preserving the original religious practices given Adam. The so-called building texts of Egyptian temples evince similarity by asserting a long line of descent from those called the senior ones, who were identified as the founders of the temples of the primeval age, who, were, who in an era rife with religious syncretism, such temple activity may have been influenced by the Hebrew temple or, as in the case of Egypt, may have influenced the Hebrew temple. Elements of the Egyptian temple ceremony are alluded to in the Pearl of Great Price and may have thus been a predicate for Joseph Smith's restoration of ancient patterns of temple worship. What Margaret Barker has done to enlighten about the role and function of the Hebrew temple and its early Christian descendants, so Hugh Nibley did to reveal the Egyptian temple as a predecessor of the Hebrew temple, as well as an heir to the temple ceremonial of Enoch, who was identified among the Egyptians as Thoth, whose religious ritual the Egyptians dated back to the time of Thoth's progenitor, Atom, creator God, and physical father of those assigned to inhabit this sphere. In Egyptian temple ceremonial, Atom makes covenant with the head god of the gods, Amun, to whom in the Egyptian rite, return and ascent provided way back into the presence of Amun. The ritual cleansing, anointing, and clothing of initiates Traversing the cosmos through ascent in the solar bark of Horus all served the ultimate purpose of returning temple initiates to Father Amun, where at the end of the temple rite, they would be ceremonially seated upon Amun's throne to receive crowns of godhood. To what extent Hebrew patriarchs such as Abraham or Joseph and even the prophet Moses were familiar with this ceremonial is an important consideration. The Book of Abraham, as well as Genesis and the Genesis Apocryphon, place Abraham in Egypt. Professor Nibley summarized his long study of Abraham in Egypt to offer the observation that it is in Egypt that Abraham was most at home. In his own country, he was an outcast, and he was pushed from place to place in Canaan, it was only in Egypt that he came into his own. He was, in fact, almost as thoroughly Egyptianized as his noble descendant, Joseph. Joseph is also much connected to Egypt, where he is known to have become a ruler and high priest of On, married to the high lady Aseneth 
from a royal line of Egypt, daughter of the chief priest of On, the holiest temple city of Egypt, which was called Heliopolis by the Greeks because it was the center of the heliacal cult of Amun-Ra. The temple city of On was also a place sacred to Atom, as well as the location of the sacred Isha tree Egyptians believed had been defended from the serpent in the garden, and the Bimben stone of primeval creation, the holy mount of first life. Joseph is said to have ruled there, with attendant priestly responsibilities that would indicate thorough familiarity with Egyptian religion and its temple rites and symbols. More than a millennium after the time of Moses, the early Christian martyr Stephen described Moses as learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, it is a dangerous matter to attempt analysis of Moses and his contributions. As Professor Barker informed us just this morning, there existed a pro-Moses party of Deuteronomists who, ab who uh, abandoned and did their best to eradicate any knowledge of the ancient religion of the patriarchs. In similar manner, Moses may well have been redacted by such men, just as scriptures were redacted, with the result that a new Fictitious identity of Moses was created, redesigned just as Moses' original writings were rewritten. And here, to the LDS people in the audience, here we see the importance to Lehi of the plates of Laban, written in Egyptian, as Mosiah informs us, preserving in metal plate, plates the original Older Testament. A recreated Moses to serve as justification for the tremendous change that became a transition into a different, a new religion. Now, the actual pre-Deuteronomistic Moses, the unredacted Moses, uh, as a prince of Egypt, would certainly have also been versed in the temple rites of Thoth, and possibly from Moses, the unredacted Moses, came the ceremonial of the temple, the tabernacle, precursor to the Hebrew temple. Whether the knowledge of ancient temple ritual possessed by the followers of the patriarchs was limited to knowledge acquired through Egyptian temple ritual, or whether their familiarity with temple ceremony may also be accounted for by knowledge of other records of their own ancestors, which could have preserved pre-Diluvian temple rituals, or whether knowledge about the temple was received directly from heaven, as is suggested by accounts of their individual ascent experiences, is an interesting and important topic, but largely beyond the purview of this paper. However, their role in transmitting religious knowledge between Egyptians and Hebrews, and vice versa, is most pertinent. Vestiges of the same antique rituals, can also be found in various temple cultures throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. Archaeological evidences of Minoan and Anatolian ceremonies devoted to the mother goddess figure. Information about the famed Greek mysteria, whose, mysteria in Greek we call it mysteries, whose secrecy is preserved to this day, are of the earliest processional rites of archaic Roman cult barely survive and are alluded to only in sources of much later date. The temple practices of the ancient Hebrews are better documented, but have too often and for too long been interpreted in light of the later and different practices of the second temple period. In recent years, again, due to the scholarship of Dr. Barker, a more accurate understanding is forming and revealing in their true light the practices and ceremonies of temples of the first temple period. By comparison, the temple texts of ancient Egypt are extensive and extremely ancient, with some dating back as far as the fourth millennium BC. Incised upon the walls of temples and funerary monuments, these very ancient documents have withstood the ravages of time and revealed culture with temples at the center of life, and a religion devoted to the individual's return to the heavens as instructed in temples. Unlike records of the Greeks and Romans, 
These have not been so extensively lost. Nor, as in the case of the records of the Jews, these Egyptian memorials cannot be rewritten or edited or redacted or translated and retranslated, but remain as first chiseled in stone or inked upon papyri. Their great antiquity guards their authenticity and so perhaps provides us a window of knowledge from which to glean information of even older rites that may stretch back to the earliest times. Accordingly, the present paper will examine the possible intermediary place of the ancient Egyptian temple rite between the temple ceremonies of Enoch and the temple rites of the Mediterranean world, including those employed by the Hebrews from the time of Moses to Solomon's temple. Mormonism stands within the Judeo-Christian tradition, especially in relation the relation to the importance it places on the temple as a place of ordinance and instruction to assist the individual in returning to the presence of a father in heaven. Mormon theology and its own temple ceremonial share affinities and commonalities with the temple practices of ancient Israel and the earliest Christians, but also with those of ancient Egypt. Pointing out the comparative nature of these religious traditions comprised an important part of Professor Nibley's enduring scholarly contribution. Not only by means of biblical writings, Old Testament pseudepigrapha and New Testament apocrypha, but also by additional scripture that Mormonism accepts as restored through Joseph Smith, there is established a continuity of temple tradition with origins in the religious practices of Adam. At least as early as 1835, Joseph Smith began to acquire ancient Egyptian papyri. He later produced a writing called the Book of Abraham that he explained as translated from one of the papyri being an ancient account of Abraham in Egypt. A passage from that text alludes to Pharaoh's descent from Noah and his resolve to imitate the ancient practices of Adam. Abraham 1, 25-26 reads, Now the first government of Egypt was established by Pharaoh, the eldest son of Egyptus, the daughter of Ham, and it was after the manner of Ham, which was patriarchal. Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established his kingdom and judged his people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate that order established by the fathers in the first generations. In the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam and also of Noah, <clears throat> Joseph Smith included, along with the text of the book of Abraham, three facsimiles of Egyptian papyri conjectured to relate to the ancient Egyptian temple ritual. Professor Nibley discusses the facsimiles in just such a temple context and characterizes the three as, first, a sacrifice upon the lion couch altar, second, from a separate papyrus, a hypocephalus, serving as a cosmological map for the ascent through the heavens, and passing the guardians of the gates between spheres. Third, also from the first papyrus, a coronation scene, presumably upon the throne of the Most High God, whom Joseph Smith named Amun, and whom the Egyptians addressed first as Amun, and in later centuries as Amun, and also as Amun-Ra. Coming into the presence of God, and coronation upon God's throne in the highest place, similarly constituted the aftermath of the ascent, not only in Egyptian temple ritual, but also sometimes in ascent experiences briefly noted in the Bible or more fully expounded in the pseudepigraphic accounts about the ascents of Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and of course the familiar New Testament account of John's apocalypse in the book of Revelation. As the result of years of detailed study of the words of Joseph Smith, in particular how they relate to Joseph Smith's establishment of temple ceremonies, Andrew Ehat has addressed the question of the three facsimiles and how Joseph connected them to the, Egypt, the ancient Egyptian temple ritual. Quote, 
The fragments were independently captured, captioned by Joseph Smith, and the captions are directly associated by Joseph Smith with our temple ordinances. Joseph Smith, in lectures he conducted following the presentation of the ordinances of the endowment, used the facsimiles for illustration purposes during his lectures. He would discuss details of what his annotations only hinted at. First, Joseph Smith said that some of the symbols retained in the Egyptian documents were not exactly the same as the Egyptian rituals codified in the Book of the Dead. The symbols were corrupted because of the distance in time between their more ancient origin than the first Egyptian recordation of their or ordinances. While the Egyptians had patterned their ordinances after the ancient order, their reproductions, were not necessarily the same as the ordinances of Adam in the Garden of Eden or Enoch and Noah in the pre-flood era. Before directing attention to the temple rites of ancient Egypt and their parallels in other ancient Mediterranean temple cultures, it is important to understand what the purpose was behind the ancient rituals. Why did men so desire to pass through the great house of the gods? However, a few comments are first required about the use of the plural term gods and the underlying theology behind the Egyptian temple. In an age where Western religious culture has been inculcated with monotheism since the time of the circa 600 BC apostasy of the Deuteronomist that Dr. Barker has written about, the time when reference to the Most High God, El Elyon, was suppressed and the father was thus conflated with the son, Yahweh, leaving but one divine figure among the Jews, mention of multiple gods evokes in many the judgment of ignorant polytheistic pagans. I do not believe such a judgment properly extends to either the early Hebrews or to ancient Egypt, though it may have influenced the first Egyptologists who rendered the Egyptian term nater as God, and its plural, Neteru, as gods. It might be preferable to think of those so designated by a new rendering such as dwellers in the heavens. Indeed, it is well known that in ancient Hebrew religion, there were many dwellers in heaven in addition to a father god. There was his wife, about whom, as lady of the temple, Dr. Barker's recent book provides much information, and also identified as angels, there were the many sons and daughters of El. Yahweh was identified as the great angel. There were also archangels and angelic heaven dwellers of all kinds, whether seraphim, cherubim, or others. Egyptologist Eric Hornick posits as deriving from the hieroglyph for nature, which is the sign of the flag at the top of a pole, the proper translation of nature to be one charged with power, while Dmitri Reek suggests that the meaning relates to one who has come to be through ritual. The chief ritual of Egypt was, of course, what is now the subject of our study, in which first of anyone in the world, Osiris, the nature who on earth died and was resurrected, passed upward in ascent and returned to his father, opening the way for others to follow. Could nature be considered to refer to one who has made the heavenly ascent back to Amun, the very theme of the ancient temple ritual? And is the word neteru not to be translated gods, but more properly rendered ascendant ones, or those who have completed the heavenly ascent? Could this language be synonymous with the Christian usage in Matthew 5.48, where Jerome translated into the Latin Vulgate the Latin word perfectus for the word teleos in the Greek New Testament text. Jerome was not mistaken since his, in his translation, the Latin verb perficio, of which perfectus is a participle, shares meaning with the Greek verb teleo, from which teleos derives. The actual meaning, both of perficio and teleo, is completed. 
having come to the end and can be employed in relation to completing the ascent. Might we then translate the verse not as, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect, but rather, Complete the ascent, such as your Father in heaven completed the ascent. After all, the Sermon on the Mount, which Professor Welch will talk to us about in just a moment, is itself a temple text, and such an allusion to the ascent would not be out of place. Moreover, herein is an additional connection to Mormon tradition, since such an interpretation fits with Joseph Smith's teachings of eternal progression, where man's potential is to return to Father in Heaven and become like him. In his final conference address in April 1844, Joseph Smith exclaimed, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens, explaining to the congregation, you have got to learn to be gods yourselves, the same as all gods have done before you, by going from one small degree to another, from exaltation to exaltation, until you are able to dwell in everlasting burnings and sit in glory. Ancient Egyptian temple ritual indisputably provided for theosis. Indeed, perhaps the most important purpose of the temple ritual was to assist men in returning to and joining the company of the Neteru in the heavens. The coronation follows the ascent, and as part of the coronation sequence, the initiate is ceremonially received back to Father Amun, where acceptance into the company of the Neteru is confirmed by words recorded in an inscription upon an 18th dynasty stele on which are inscribed the words of the initiate as he declares himself a son come back to claim the inheritance of eternal life from his father, Amen. The statement is evocative of Christ's declaration to John in Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and are set down with my father in his throne. Proof that the Egyptians believed that the ascent and its resultant divinization was not merely a matter of ceremonial enactment, but could transpire in actuality, is demonstrated by the examples of Imhotep and Amenhotep neither of whom were pharaohs, but rather men of learning and wisdom, separated from one another in life by 1,200 years. The former, chief scribe and architect of the world's first cut stone building, the Step Pyramid of Djoser in the Third Dynasty. The latter, a 15th century B.C. scribe, astronomer, mathematician, and designer of the temples at Karnak, both ascended through the heavens to become divinized. And though real men, historical figures beyond doubt, whose existence is attested in many monuments and documents, they were in time hailed as gods and worshipped in their own temples, examples of human beings whose beneficent labors were held up to others as exemplars to be equaled. In the limited time allowed me for this presentation, there is no opportunity for the exposition of a theogony of the Egyptian gods. However, a few of their most important divinities, those who are inextricably connected with the temple rites, require at least brief mention. Central to the Egyptian pantheon is the divine high triad comprised of Amun, his consort Hathor, sometimes alternatively renamed Mut, and his son Horus, and sometimes in places identified as Khonsu. In the later centuries of Egyptian religion, remember Egyptian religion goes for 4,000 years, a second triad comprised of younger gods appears in ritual and worship. It consists of Osiris, his wife Isis, and their son generally identified as Horus the Younger. In the ceremonial procession of entry to the temple precinct at the great temple of Amun in Thebes, past way stations marking the pathway of eternal life, simulacra, or platform-mounted effigies, 
of almond, moot, and kansu were carried before the initiates to open the way in a fashion reminiscent of later Roman lectisternial processions. Finally, it is to the presence of this ancient familial triad and into their ceremonial embraces, paternal, maternal, and fraternal, that the initiate returns after his ascent. The presence of a similar divine triad of father, mother, and son in early Hebrew religion and in the first temple has been established by Dr. Barker in her most recent work when she demonstrates the identity of the lady in the temple to be not the consort of Yahweh, but rather the wife of El and the mother of Yahweh. It is to Amun's presence that initiates as followers of Horus seek to descend by ceremonial, seek to ascend by ceremonial means in the Egyptian rites. In the pyramid writings, the earliest religious writings of substance, Amun is described as the creator of all, the ultimate source of life, force, and energy. He is frequently called the hidden one, alluding perhaps to man's search for the lost way to return to his presence. He is generally depicted as a man in a cosmic crown of two feather plumes, perhaps representing light and truth. On hypocephali, as in the Pearl of Great Price facsimile 2, Amun is represented with straight ram horns, often having two or four faces, and holding both his rod of authority and his staff of power. Amun's syncretic influence may have been widespread, among different Mediterranean religious cultures. For example, the iconography of the Roman god Janus is similar, depicted with two faces or sometimes quadrophons with four faces and occasionally with straight ram's horns bearing rod and staff of authority. Janus was the chief god of the very earliest archaic Roman cult, celebrated in the Carmen Saliari as father of gods, and god of gods, titles share with, both with the Egyptian Amun and the Hebrew El Elyon. He is conjectured by some to derive ultimately from Amun, a, hypo a hypothesis lent credence by Augustus's placement in a new temple of Janus as its cult statue, a statue of Amun that he brought back to Rome from Egypt. In hypocephali, including facsimile two, Horus is represented by his familiar falcon iconography. He is enthroned in his solar bark, the Egyptian version of the Hebrew fiery throne chariot, as a means of heavenly conveyance, including indicating his role in facilitating ascent into the presence of Amun. His alternate, alternate appellation of Konsu, which signifies one who is in motion, may have similar association. Horus is sometimes titled the opener of the ways. It is Horus who overcomes and defeats the evil set in combat, placing his own left eye lost in battle, the Wejot, in the midst of the undying circumpolar stars to serve as a beacon for the way of the ascent. The distinction between Horus and Osiris may be similar to that between Yahweh and Christ, a mere difference of name one heavenly, the other for use on earth. For in earthly guise, Horus is Osiris, who is killed by Set, but through the assistance of his wife Isis is resurrected. These events were dramatically depicted in the triennial religious celebration known as the Set Festival, which, despite its name, commemorated the resurrection of Osiris and the triumph of Horus as well as the restoration of the cosmic covenant with its equinoctial balance between opposing solstices and also celebrated the procession of ascent and other temple ceremonies. Not only documents, but also pictorial representations name Horus as Osiris, as Osiris Saker and depict Horus as rising from the dead body of Osiris. It is Osiris Horus who, after his resurrection, is acknowledged as the first being to have lived on earth to make the ascent to the heavens, and in ritual ceremony, initiates follow the path set by Osiris Horus 
to return to Amun. Hathor is the lady in the temple in ancient Egypt, wearing on her head the solar disk surrounded with cow horns. Hathor symbolizes the nexus between the heaven and the earth, just as Hathor, depicted in bovine form, is situated at the junction of juncture of the two realms in the aforementioned facsimile number two. Accordingly, her involvement in the ritual is at several stages of the process, both those earthly and those heavenly. She presides over an assortment of goddesses in the garden where washing and anointing is performed. As Hathor anointed Horus with nine fiery oils to enable his ascent, so in the ceremony of the Piranesar, the shrine of fire, does she also anoint initiates before their ascent, either in her identity as Hathor, mother of gods, or in her syncretic guise as Sekhmet, lady of the lines. Perhaps to honor Hathor, as well as to imitate the skin garment of the god Atom, it is in lion skins that initiates are first clothed before entering the inner temple to later receive robes of light. All these ceremonies are conducted in the garden, an outside garden, through which the earth is entered and departed. In that place, Hathor bears the title of Lady of the Ishet, or Lady of the Sycamore, an epithet which acknowledges her actions protecting her sacred tree of life from the great serpent. When the initiate completes his ascent, as noted above, Hathor as one of the divine triad embraces him, after which she also plays a part in his theosis by seating him upon the throne, the very event represented in facsimile 3. Hathor's symbol, the winged sun disk, is found throughout temples where the initiation ceremony is conducted as well as at a recently discovered Hathor temple site at Sarabit in the Sinai, where archaeological evidence locates votive offerings to her, not only of Egyptians, but also of Hebrews. Dr. Barker has pointed out not only the use of this symbol, the winged sun disk, in Solomon's temple, but also its connections with the lady in the temple. Similar connections to Hathor include items removed from the Holy of Holies in the Josiah Reform, such as the sacred tree and the golden calf throne of the lady. Moreover, like Hathor, the lady plays a role in theosis, while the lady's persona of Ariel, named by Isaiah the lioness of El, is strikingly like the Sekhmet persona of Hathor. So also the person and symbols of the Anatolian great mother goddess, later adopted as Magna Mater by the Romans. Finally, the role of Thoth in the temple must be noted, for in Thoth exists the important link between the temples of Egypt and the pre-Diluvian temple of Enoch. Thoth is not only the guide who leads initiates through the ceremony, but also the being to whom is attributed the inception of the ceremony, often referred to as the rites of Thoth. To Thoth is ascribed the authorship of the Book of Readings, perhaps the most fruitful source of information about the Egyptian temple ritual. The functions performed by Thoth are revealed in his many titles, which include Lord of the Divine Words, Keeper of the Secret Knowledge, Inventor of Writing, Keeper of the Book of Life, Scribe of the Gods, Journeyer through the Heavens in Quest of Knowledge, Founder of Temples, and Heavenly Originator of the Temple Ceremony. These titles and the functions they describe bear striking similarity to the roles reported in the Books of Enoch as performed by Enoch. Professor Nibley recognized this connection and concluded, Thoth is an Enoch figure, Keeper of the Heavenly and Earthly Books of Remembrance, and teacher of heavenly wisdom to men. Moreover, a non-temple-related connection between Enoch and Thoth furthers the possibility of their syncretism. They are both connected in being assigned to bring to pass the deluge, the great flood. The books of Enoch recount his charge to open the fountains of the deep. 
while Thoth is required to return the earth to the waters of noon. Entry to the sacred precincts of the temple is regulated by Thoth as the divine guide, and participation in the temple ceremonial was open only to the, those he judged to be pure in heart, for the rites pointed one to the way, made accessible by Horus as opener of the way, for Thoth, like Enoch, had seen the cosmos, knew the path of ascent, and as vizier of Horus was permitted to reveal the way back to Amun. Perhaps the most important function of temples in Egypt was to teach that way back. In other words, the path of heavenly ascent. As revealed in Salt Papyrus 825, important additional functions of the temple and its rites were the role of maintaining the balance of the cosmic covenant and the role of serving as a scale model of the universe. Not only enabling man to find his way back to the heavenly realm, but also permitting him to survey his place in relation to the cosmos. Dr. Barker has emphasized the importance of the everlasting covenant to the ancient Hebrews, as well as to the early Christians, examining the cosmic covenant, covenant elucidated in First Enoch, whereby heavenly bodies maintain their place in proper location and in good harmony with the rest of God's creation, in accordance with the oath that binds them. For the Egyptians, balancing the cosmic covenant signifies keeping at bay what they refer to as chaos, namely the disorganization or the entropy of existing matter. And to overcome final chaos, the ultimate entropic disorganization is to co conquer death. In Egypt, chaos was disorganization of matter and energy, and creation was organization of matter and energy. Another purpose of the temple was to disseminate vital teachings of how to maintain a pure heart in a corrupted world, and so gain access to the ascent back to heavenly spheres. These were taught in the context of the events of a pre-mortal council of the gods, and the consequent dispute between Set and Osiris that brought about the death of Osiris, as well as the larger cosmic struggle between Set and Horus that entailed defense of Amun's whole creation. By choosing Osiris Horus and becoming at one with him, the purpose of the temple was fulfilled, and the initiate, through at one -ment, could join the company of the Neteru, or in the words of Mircea Eliade, bring about a restoration of the primordial unity that existed before the creation in order to restore the whole that preceded the creation. Similarly, the initiate was taught essential perspectives through understanding the temple as a scale model of the cosmos. Professor Nibley suggests that the temple, which contained even libraries, existed for teaching purposes as well as for ritual experience. Part of that teaching was to take bearings of the universe and in the eternities, both in time and space. Accordingly, the Egyptian temple served as an astronomical observatory where the cycles of the sun, moon, and stars were charted and recorded, as well as the progress of, the, of equinoctial processions believed to indicate the coming of future events in correspondence to the sun as it followed its equinoctial path through constellations where important historical events were believed to have been placed uh, and prefigured in prefigurement by the gods. An extremely ancient passage from the pyramid texts described the sightings of sun, moon, and stars at, at the temple through established apertures that were placed in the temple structure to mark the progression of the solar year. Stars were considered not only the realm of the undying ones, but also beacons marking the path back to Amun hidden in their midst. The Egyptian temple was therefore the center of both a heliacal stellar cult and the center of the important solar cult. Early astronomical parallels are shared with Hebrew religion and its temple. 
the notion of stars as the dwelling place of heavenly beings. It was not unfamiliar to the early Hebrews since the book of Numbers identifies great angelic figures as stars. Abraham was widely known to have been skillful in celestial science and is said to have attributed to Enoch his expertise in the science of the stars. Of course, it is Enoch to whom ancient Jewish accounts give credit for establishing the astral arts since the secrets of the stars were first revealed to him in conjunction with the ascent experience that is chronicled in the books of Enoch. Not only comprehension of the stars, but also knowledge of the sun and, their so and the solar calendar belong to Enoch as Enoch's book of astronomy, that's 1 Enoch 72 to 82, reveals by describing the sun as placed in a circuit around, around 182 waning thrones and 182 waxing thrones. Here is yet another link between Enoch as astronomer and Thoth, who in his additional role of lunar deity taught the Egyptians about sun, moon, and stars, and also about calendars. Just as the Egyptian temple promoted the solar cult with a solar calendar, Dr. Barker has collected convincing evidence that a solar cult and solar calendar were part of the temple cult of Solomon's temple. Indeed, not only the chariot of the sun atop the temple, or the solar calendar followed in that era by the temple, but also certain associations of the sun with the lady in particular, paralleling the sun connections of Hathor in Egypt, established the reality of a solar cult among the Hebrews, possibly brought with them from their Egyptian sojourn. In the religious practices of various cultures, the heavens are marked and platted in the place where they are believed to be closest to the earth, at the nexus point where intersection of heaven and earth occurs. It was for this reason that in Egypt, the founding of the temple had to be conducted in a manner of foundation that reflected the will of heaven. The same was true of Greek temples, whose temenos had to be designated through mantic means. And for Roman temples that were established through our augural ritual in the pattern of the Etruscans. Indeed, the English word temple derives from the Latin templum, which derives from the Etruscan template, a word indicating the process by which a template pattern was revealed in the sky in order to find a nexus point and so permit sacred boundaries to be drawn in the indicated temple site. The template was not the structure, but more properly, the land marked out and dedicated as sacred, the temple precinct, if you will. Any buildings raised on the site had to be properly oriented to the cardinal directions, with the most important orientation being to the east. Only through correct site selection and situation upon the site could temples tap the source of divine power, which transformed them into what Nibley described as cosmic powerhouses. In this manner, the temple was transformed into a scale model of the cosmos. The Temple of Solomon showed a certain similarity to an Egyptian temple in that the temple precinct contained not only the temple edifice proper, but other buildings or courtyards where ceremony was performed. That temple provided for the outdoor performance of cleansing and sacrificial rituals. So too in the Temple of Egypt, in Egypt, where initial rites such as sacrifice, washing, anointing, clothing, and animal skins were conducted in a garden area courtyard of the temple. The temple itself was entered by passing through two great pylons. Similar to Joachim and Boaz pillars of Solomon's temple. Even in the most primitive era when Egyptian temples were tabernacula, tent like structures of woven reeds, at their entrances were placed great wooden pillars. In most of the historical era, pylons or great columns, and in the later period, obelisks were erected at the entrance to the temple sanctuary and had to be passed through to enter. All of these initial gates were situated so that, so that at the winter solstice, 
they framed the rising sun. The sun rising between the pylons formed the hieroglyph called the Ot, or sometimes the Aket. The hieroglyph for the horizon, the place where man joined God, becoming at one with him. The temple itself was intended as a place of horizon as witnessed by its great pylons. While the actual temple buildings vary in style and structures might be readily supposed since their individual planning and construction span three millennia, there are often commonalities in locations where the rites of Thoth were performed. One first enters several great halls of assembly where sequences of the temple drama may have been presented, including the Hall of Geb and Shu, the place for the presentation of what has been called the creation sequence. But it is important to note that this is more properly described as the place where various of the gods are involved in the organization and arrangement of energy and matter to fashion the world and its surrounding heavens and to place a veil that will divide that organized substance from other worlds and spheres. Indeed, a great pillared hypostyle hall may be associated with explanations about the eternal worlds since each column was designed to represent the support of a world or a sphere of heaven. A significant part of the drama occurs in the next great hall, that of the garden. When initiates are ready to depart the garden and so this earthly sphere, they must pass through a veil to begin their ascent. Veils are also found throughout the temple placed to close off sacred areas. The path of the ascent or the perilous passage proceeds in turn through either seven gates or seven veils and rises through seven successive chambers. However, the gates define the boundaries of heavenly spheres and to pass. Proper signs and symbols must be revealed to guardians at the gates. The seven chambers are variously arranged in Egyptian temples, sometimes in a straight line leading to the innermost eighth chamber, called the House of God, where Amun's throne is located. In some structures, the seven, seven chambers surround the House of God, while in others, they proceed toward it, toward it in an upward spiral. Finally, there was a chamber at the end of the process, designed to give view to the temple pylons and the sun rising between them. The initiate ended his initiation ceremony at the rising of the sun, and so became one on the horizon with Amun. Those familiar with the design of Solomon's temple will note several commonalities. Aspects of the rituals and ceremonies performed in the Egyptian temple are mentioned in a variety of sources. They include pyramid texts, the Book of the Dead, books of breathings, coffin texts, the Book of Wandering Through Eternity, and a host of papyri or monumental inscriptions. Professor Nibley used all of these sources in his study of the Egyptian endowment, but relied particularly on two papyri of the Book of Breathings, Papyrus Louvre, number 3284, and Papyrus Leiden, T32. The survival of so many sources from over several millennia constitutes a remarkable information pool about the Egyptian temple. Nevertheless, only partial reconstruction of the ancient rites can be achieved. Furthermore, the setting of any single aspect of the ritual in any particular time or duration of time over a 3,000-year period is extremely daunting. In his study of the ritual, Professor Nibley discussed the initiatory and purificatory rites of the outer garden, followed by the creation, the garden drama, and finally the journey of the initiation and the stages of its ritual variously identified as the long road back or the perilous passage or the ascent. He concludes, of course, with the ritual embraces and the coronation that occur at the end of the ceremony. A full elucidation of the ancient mysteries of the Egyptian temple would take many days, and discussion of related cosmological themes would occupy many more days. For those interested in detailed information, I recommend Professor Nibley's The Message of the Joseph Smith Papari, an Egyptian Endowment. For careful study of the Hebrew ceremonial of the First Temple era, I recommend in particular Dr. Barker's The Gate of Heaven, and most particularly her very recently completed book, The Mother of the Lord, Volume 1 of the Lady in the Temple.
the entire Egyptian ceremony must be understood as a procession. In a sense, it represents the process of progression all must undertake. The initiates enter the temple in an entry procession, in which they are accompanied by the divine triad, received by Thoth, who escorts them through the rites he originated, uh, at least until they enter the phase of the ascent, when Osiris Horus uh, joins the company to proceed through the way he opened up. When the procession comes to an end, the initiates are received back into the presence of the divine triad. Processions also mark the religious rituals of ancient Greece and Rome and may indicate a survival of what was once an ancient form of a similar temple ceremony perhaps received from the Egyptians, perhaps retained through other means. The Greeks celebrated just outside of Athens the famed Eleusinian mysteries of the mother goddess Demeter. The Greek word mysteria simply signifies secret ceremony, and the participants were very careful to keep their secrets, so careful, in fact, that in Greece and Egypt, the rites of eternal life are still imperfectly understood because the secrets were kept. At best, only parts of the ceremonies can be reconstructed. The classical age mysteries of Demeter and her processional with its symbolic ascent of souls in the sacred chariot, or the earliest Mycenaean era processional rites of the mother goddess, guarded by sacred lions, seated in, not a chariot, but a sacred bark, and crowned with aether-like solar disk and horns, may well have been passed to the Greeks from the Minoans, among whom existed many Egyptian influences in all areas of life, including religion. In the earliest days of Rome, the Amun counterpart Janus was the god of processions and of gates, especially and particularly the gates possibly seven in number, that the procession passed through. Janus was a Uronic or sky deity who guarded gates and doorways, which perhaps represented heavenly boundaries. Moreover, Janus was the god associated with the solar cult at Rome, in whose temple was preserved the solar calendar. Janus led these processions, perhaps intended as part of a salvatory or cleansing ritual. It was, of course, and he was seated in a bark, similar to the solar bark of Horus that the divine ascent was accomplished. In it, Horus sat enthroned amidst his followers in a fashion reminiscent of the fiery chariot of the Hebrew ascent, which was a throne chariot in which the heavenly court or various of its members were conveyed in heavenly processional. In the Egyptian processional of ascent, in company with Horus, the initiate and other divine figures traveled in the solar bark up the fiery stairway of ascent and joined Amun in the horizon. Finally, at the conclusion, this ceremonial enactment of ascent and preparatory ritual to the coronation and entry to the horizon into the brilliant rays of the rising sun, <coughs> the initiate was reclothed in royal regalia as the son of Amun, and presented the crook and flail of his dominion, and also the atef crown of Osiris with shoe feathers symbolizing the passage of light between worlds. He repeated this ceremonial speech. I have sailed in the bark of the sun. I have come to the place of Horus's eye. I am the unbroken seal on the book of myself. My words are heartfelt. My prayers are like incense to the nostrils of the gods. My spirit flames with the fire of God. I have become a shining Osiris. My face is aglow with radiating white light. Open the way to me. The gate opens, and Osiris reveals himself face to face declaring his identity as Osiris Horus. I am the eldest son of the Great One who dwells in eternal burnings, son of the Burning One. 
I am exalted. I am renewed. I am rejuvenated. I am Osiris Horus, and so now, thou too. It's the Book of the Dead, chapter 43. It's the initiate exits to view the sun, rising between the two great pylons, and John Amon in the place of the horizon. He first must utter an oath of fealty to Amon, which he utters, and Amon then responds with this word of acceptance and promise of eternal life. Yea, thou art my son. The course covers of Dr. Barker's books often depict mosaics from early Christian churches in the late antique Ravenna. These Ravenna mosaics represent scenes of altars surrounded by veils on which are marked gamadia, symbols of the ancient square instrument by means of which straight lines were drawn. This symbol was also frequently found inscribed on the ancient Egyptian temple, along with the image of compasses. Professor Nibley explained their presence as representing the tools of geometry used by ancient astronomers who sought to chart the path back to God. The ancient rites of thought, just as did the ancient rites of Enoch, endeavored to reveal to men that very pathway back, at the end of which Osiris Horus might be seen face to face, and faithful children restored to the presence and the embrace of their father, assuming roles to which they were heir. In a conference with the theme of Mormonism in the temple, it is perhaps not untoward to close with two of Joseph Smith's revelations, wherein elements of that pathway back are mentioned. First, DNC 93.1. Verily, thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice shall see my face and know that I am. In DNC 132, 21 to 22. And they shall pass by the angels and the gods, which are set there through the gates to their exaltation and glory in all things. Then shall they be gods, because they have no end. Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting, because they continue, because all things are subject to them. Therein they shall be gods. Those two passages, I think, would not be at all unfamiliar to the initiate who passed through the ancient Egyptian temple. They would be familiar and as Abraham felt at home among the Egyptians, I think people who believed in those passages would feel at home among them too, as they had a common purpose of seeking to do all that was possible to return to the presence of Amun, their father in heaven, and assume their roles as true sons and daughters. Thank you very much.